on the afternoon of the 26th of December 1900, a small ship was making its way towards a remote cluster of bleak rocks, known as the Flannan Isles, in the Outer Hebrides. Captain James Harvey planned to land a replacement for one of the three men stationed at the Flannan Lighthouse. But as the ship neared the landing stage, Harvey was surprised to see no one there to welcome him. He blew the ship's whistle and fired a distress flare high into the sky, hoping to attract attention. There was no response. Meanwhile, Joseph Moore, the relief keeper, rowed ashore and scrambled up the steep steps which wound their way to the lighthouse at the top of the cliff. When he opened the door, Moore realized at once that something was terribly wrong. He made his way to the kitchen. There he found that the clock had stopped and one of the chairs was overturned on the floor as if someone had got up in a great hurry. The remains of a half-eaten meal lay on the table and the ashes in the fire grate were cold. None of the beds looked as if they'd been slept in. Moore then frantically searched the rest of the lighthouse, but there was no sign of the three keepers. They had completely vanished. The Flannan Lighthouse was built between 1896 and 1899 at a cost of just under £7,000 by David Stevenson, a relative of the famous writer Robert Louis Stevenson. Designed to withstand high seas and gale force winds, the lighthouse was seemingly impervious to anything the elements could throw against it. 75 feet high, it stood at the top of a 150-foot cliff. Generating 100,000 candle power, it flashed twice every 30 seconds and could be seen for 20 miles in every direction. It was owned by the Northern Lighthouse Board in Edinburgh, which by the end of the 19th century operated more than 80 lighthouses in Scotland and the neighbouring islands, employing 600 men. Flannan Lighthouse is based on Eileen Moor in the North Atlantic, the largest of seven rocky islands making up the Flannans, known to generations of seafarers as the Seven Hunters. It lies 18 miles off Lewis in the Outer Hebrides and about 65 miles from the northwest coast of Scotland. Until the lighthouse was built, a great many merchant ships and fishing boats had foundered in the treacherous seas around the Flannans. The only other structures on Eileen Moor are the remains of a small stone chapel and several ancient dwellings. The chapel was built by Flannan, a 6th century Irish bishop. Believed to have brought good fortune to everyone he touched, Flannan was later dubbed a saint and the islands were named in his honour. Shepherds had once brought sheep over from other Hebridean islands to graze on Eileen Moore's rich turf. But because the island was said to be haunted by sea spirits and maybe even St. Flannan himself, none of the shepherds ever spent the night there. Apart from the lighthouse keepers on Eileen Moor, the islands were deserted. It was a lonely and isolated existence, but there was never any shortage of men wanting to work there. Their duties were not particularly onerous. Working in two-week shifts, they had to keep the light and the mechanical parts in good working order and polish the lenses every day, maintain the lighthouse buildings and make sure their living quarters were always clean and tidy. At the time, there was no radio contact between the Flannans and the Isle of Lewis. Gamekeeper Roderick Mackenzie was paid £8 a year to watch the light from the mainland. If the light failed, he was to report it immediately to the Northern Lighthouse Board's headquarters in Edinburgh. Since the Flannan Lighthouse had first become operational in December 1899, Mackenzie had never felt the need to make such a report. On the 15th of December 1900, the SS Arch Tour, an American tramp steamer, was making her way from Philadelphia to the port of Leith near Edinburgh. As he sailed past the Flannans just before midnight, Captain Holman made out the dark, brooding mass of Eileen Moore. But much to his consternation, he did not see the light flashing. The arch tour arrived at Leith three days later and Holman immediately reported the matter to the port authorities. But the information was not passed on to the Northern Lighthouse Board. Robert Mackenzie also failed to report there was something amiss. At Christmas, Flannan was manned by three men. James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, the second assistant, and Donald MacArthur, an occasional keeper, who was standing in for William Ross, the first assistant, who was on sick leave. One of the keepers was to be replaced by Joseph Moore. He'd been waiting for the weather to improve, staring anxiously across the sea towards Eileen Moore, 
where no light could be seen emanating from the tower. On the 26th of December, Moore was finally able to leave Lewis and begin his 18-mile voyage out to the island. As the ship approached the rocky island, Moore felt a deep sense of foreboding. Could something terrible have happened to the three keepers? By the 26th of December 1900, the Flannan lights had not been seen for 11 days, but the seas had been too rough for any ship to approach the remote rocky outcrop. When the weather abated, the Northern Lighthouse Board steamer, the Hesperus, began making steady progress towards the Flannans. Like everyone else, Captain James Harvey was extremely worried about the three keepers. As the ship neared the island, no one was to be seen on the small landing stage. Hoping to attract attention, Harvey blasted the ship's whistle several times and fired a flare into the sky. Joseph Moore, who was due to replace one of the three keepers, then rowed ashore in a small boat. He landed and ran up the steps to the lighthouse as fast as he could, frantically calling out their names. There was no response. All he could hear was the eerie cries of wheeling birds and the sound of the waves crashing against the rocks. As he neared the tower, Moore feared the worst. Finding the door unlocked, he went straight for the kitchen, the usual hub of any domestic activity. He was confronted with the remains of a half-eaten meal, a clock that had stopped, and an overturned chair. None of the beds had been slept in. Moore then ran through the entire building from top to bottom. But no matter how hard he searched, the only sign of life he could find was a half-starved canary in its cage. The light mechanism appeared to be in proper working order. Moore was then joined by men from the Hesperus. They all combed the small island from end to end but there was still no trace of the three keepers. Captain Harvey dispatched a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board headquarters, reporting the mystery. A few days later, Robert Muirhead, the board superintendent, who'd appointed the three men and knew them personally, arrived at Flannan to investigate further. He said at the time, I have the melancholy recollection that I was the last person to shake hands with them and bid them adieu. Muirhead carefully was the last person to shake hands with them and bid them adieu. Muirhead carefully went through the lighthouse and its ancillary buildings looking for clues. Apart from the half-eaten meal and overturned chair in the kitchen, he could find nothing amiss. He checked the log. The last entry was dated the morning of the 15th of December and reported nothing out of the ordinary. But Muirhead was intrigued by the sight of one set of oilskins hanging in the entrance hall. Where were the other two? Had one of the men gone outdoors on a freezing December day dressed only in light clothing? If so, why? Lighthouse regulations expressly forbade the three keepers to be outside at the same time. What had prompted them to break the rules? Muirhead could only speculate. He then checked the landing stage area, but because the seas were so heavy, could get no nearer than the crane platform, 70 feet above the crashing waves. Muirhead immediately noticed that the rocks and crevices below were strewn with uncoiled rope, usually stored in a large wooden box at the crane site, but the box was missing. The iron railings around the landing stage were bent and twisted out of shape. A large block of stone, weighing at least a ton, had been dislodged from the cliff face and had smashed down onto the landing stage. In his subsequent report to a board of inquiry held in Edinburgh in July 1901, Muirhead concluded that the three men had probably left the lighthouse to secure the wooden box when it was threatened with bad weather. As they were working, they were likely overwhelmed by a huge unexpected wave and swept out to sea, never to be seen again. But not everyone was convinced by this explanation. There were just too many unanswered questions. 
Why had none of the bodies been swept back to shore as usually happened in these waters? Why had three highly experienced men been apparently taken unawares by a freak wave? And why were two of them outside in oilskins, while the third was only lightly dressed? And the weather on the 15th of December, the day the men were thought to have disappeared, was calm. The storms did not start until the following day. As the years passed, the mystery only deepened. Some were convinced they could hear ghostly voices in the wind, mournfully calling out the names of the lost men. Albert Petri, a normally pragmatic keeper from the mainland, expressed his own feelings. The Florence is a rock station. It's just, once you're there, it's like any other rock station. It's, but the thought of coming here, coming to the Florence, is pretty dreadful. It seems to have a bad sort of name throughout the service. Whenever anybody hears about going to the Florence, it sort of sends a shock down their spine sort of thing. But uh, once you're here, as I say, it's just like any other rock station. Petri was asked what he thought had happened so many years earlier. There's lots of funny, queer superstitions about the mystery. We've even heard it suggested that the foreign power, a boat from a foreign power had landed and took the keepers away. For what reason, I don't know. There couldn't be much of a spy out here. But, and it's even been suggested that a spaceship had packed them off. Another keeper had a more logical explanation. up with all sorts of ideas of what could have happened but uh, I think one thing who nobody will come up with a definite answer now but it looks to me as if they had gone down to try and secure something down at the landing and uh, one got carried away by the sea and the rest sort of tried to save him and they got carried away but uh, you hear all sorts of different opinions and different views of views of it, but I don't think anybody will ever come up with a definite answer now. The story of the missing lighthouse keepers has continued to intrigue people over the years. In 1912, the poet Wilfred Wilson Gibson wrote Flannan Isle. In this long poem, a supernatural force overcomes the three men and turns them into seabirds. Gibson was inspired by Joseph Moore, the first man on the island following the disappearance, who'd allegedly seen three strange black birds watching him from a rock as he landed. The birds then took off into the air and dived noiselessly into the swirling sea. The mysterious fates of the three men even inspired an opera, The Lighthouse, which premiered at the Edinburgh Festival in 1980. Composed by Sir Peter Maxwell Davis, it has been performed hundreds of times since. I remember, it must have been the late 70s, I was reading Craig Mayer's book about the Scottish lighthouses, being interested in them, living in Orkney anyway, and in this book there was this tale of the Flannan Isles and this strange disappearance of the Three Keepers in 1900, and I remember thinking, well, that would make a good subject for an opera, perhaps. As he walked the length and breadth of Eileen Moore, Sir Peter became immersed in the story. I have a feeling on this island of tension even just walking about as if there's a whole army of ghosts around us. I read the accounts of the Court of Inquiry into the disappearance of the keepers. I took quite a lot of liberty and my story became psychological if you like. There were three keepers stranded in the lighthouse beyond their term getting on each other's nerves and I contrasted their characters so that there was no way out of this at all. Sir Peter didn't need to look far for musical inspiration. His raw material was what the men themselves would have heard. The piercing cries of seabirds, waves crashing against the cliff face, and the eerie sound of seals calling to each other in the night. The opera does recreate the whole atmosphere of being on an island of this sort under those conditions in winter where you're alone with the elements, anything can happen. Even 80 years after their disappearance, nothing could quell the rumours and speculation concerning the men's fate. It was suggested that one of the keepers was an alcoholic who, when drunk, pushed the others to their deaths and then drowned himself. 
there was no shortage of theories. One, that all three had fallen into the sea while fighting over a woman. Another, that they had been killed by a sea monster, which snatched them from the landing stage. Sir Peter had his own, much less fanciful, explanation. I suspect that, um, for whatever reason, they must have been swept away by a freak wave, and I know from my own experience these freak waves happen. What they were doing outside, why they went out, one doesn't know, but that is the most likely explanation. Even though the Flannan Lighthouse continued to hold a particular dread for subsequent keepers, nothing unusual has occurred there since the disappearance of the three men in 1900. In September 1971, the light became fully automated. Now the bleak outpost is visited only occasionally, by helicopter or by maintenance vessels. As in lighthouses all over the world, computers have replaced the dedicated men who maintained the machinery, kept the wicks trimmed and polished the huge revolving lenses. But their purpose remains the same, to warn seafarers of impending danger. Precisely what the three Flannan lighthouse keepers were doing, until they vanished so mysteriously in December 1900. Some have said that their ghosts later returned to Eileen Moore to join St. Flannan in his eternal watch over the lonely island. <laughs>